Um, yeah, so this is joint work with uh, Graham Hutton. And so what we're going to do here is show how to calculate compilers uh, with the help of monads, which will allow us to express uh, diverging behavior in our source language. So that's the plan. So here's the setup that we have. So we have given uh, the syntax and the semantics of a source language given as an algebraic data type, and then the semantics given as an interpreter right here for a very simple language, uh, Graham's favorite. And what we want to have is we want to derive from that a compiler, right, systematically. And not only that, we also want to have some kind of assurance that the compiler is correct. So we want to also have a proof of its correctness, expressed as some form of equation, as shown here. So how, do we do, how are we going to do this? So the calculation approach does this um, by starting at the proof. So what we're going to do is we're going to start proving this correctness theorem here before we even have the compiler. And then as we do this, uh, this proof, the definition will fall out of the calculation. And this might seem like, like black magic, but uh, I hope at the end of the talk I've convinced you that this actually uh, works out. And so the nice thing about this is that it uses very simple reasoning techniques, only induction and equational reasoning which partly is also one of its um, problems here. So because we only have induction, this makes it difficult um, to um, account for non-termination. So what we do here is we're going to use mon a monad to model this uh, diverging behavior, and then we're going to use uh, strong by simulation to instead of the equ equality here. So that's the plan. So what is the partiality monad? So this is a, a co-inductively defined type like this. We have two cases. We have the now case, which is just going to return a value of type A, and we can also defer the computation by one additional time step, this, this later. Right? And we can do this indefinitely, because it's a co-inductively defined type, so that we get also diverging computations. And we can give this type uh, our monad operations, return and bind, and these indeed satisfy the monad laws, up to by similarity. Um, right, by similarity. So we have, in principle, sort of two choices of uh, by similarity, a weak kind and the strong kind. So let's have a look at the weak version. So this is the one that you usually find in compiler verification, right, because it does not care about the number of steps on both sides, right? So now 42 is weakly by similar to later now 42, which makes sense because you would generally uh, expect in your compiler that uh, the code it produces does not necessarily, necessarily take the same number of steps as the source code. But unfortunately, uh, it's no good for our purposes, for, for calculation, because we cannot reason both using transitivity and by, by co-induction using our co-induction hypothesis in our proofs. Um, so this makes it completely useless for, for calculation. Let's have a look at strong by similarity. It has the problem that it's very strict, right? We only ex we expect that both computations take the same number of steps. So now 42 is not strongly by similar to later now 42. This makes it uh, completely hopeless for verification. But as it turns out, this is not a problem for calculation. Because actually, the calculation process will not only produce the compiler, it will also produce the semantics of our target language. And in particular, it will insert just the right number of, um, of later steps, of computation steps, so that the two sides, the source language and the target language, will match up. So we're going to go with, uh, with uh, strong by similarity here. OK, let's have a look at an example and see how this works here. So here we have, again, the, the simple expression language from before. And we're now going to just extend it with this silly uh, loop construct just to make the language uh, non-total. So we're going to extend the, the interpreter, which just interprets loop as eval loop. So we'll just loop uh, forever. And in order to make this definition now total, we have to do this in the, in the partiality monad turn the, the code into a monadic style using return, using return and a do block here. And crucially, now this, this uh, 
recursive call eval loop is now guarded by this later. And importantly, so first of all, this makes this definition now total as far as the meta language is concerned. Right? So we can do this in Acta and Coq, uh, no problem. And secondly, this definition now mixes uh, co-recursion and recursion. So in particular, we have here these two evals. They are recursive calls to uh, structurally smaller x and y arguments. And then we have here the, the eval call here, which does not call on a structurally smaller argument, but instead it is guarded by later. So this is a well-defined uh, semantics here. So this is our, our, our semantics here on the left. And now, as, as I said, what we want to do is we want to derive this compiler here, right, that turns uh, our expression language to some code. And we're not sure what the code is that will be derived by the calculation, as will be the virtual machine, so the semantics of the, of the target language, right, which takes uh, a piece of code, it will take a stack, which is just uh, a list of integers, and then it will produce uh, the stack that we have after we have executed the code that we've given. Right, so that's the setup that we want to derive. And then we also, as I said, we want to, do, we want to have proof of its correctness of the compiler. Okay, so now the plan is to, to calculate uh, this, uh, this compiler using this specification that we have here, using uh, strong by similarity. But to make the calculation go through, we actually have to generalize it uh, slightly and have to ask the compiler to take a continuation argument here. Right? So for, for a given expression and some continuation, it produces the code for the expression followed by the code that we give here. And we have to accordingly also generalize the uh, specification here, right? which now says that if we evaluate the expression E, we stick the result on top of the stack, execute the continuation, and that is the same as executing the compiled code on the right here. All right, and the procedure is, as outlined before, we prove this property and we get then out the definition on the other end. So that's the plan. So let's go through this. Let's do this for the simple language. So this is what we want to prove. This is our specification. And we're going to go through this uh, by induction and co-induction. Right? So this matches what we've seen earlier, the, the semantics, which was uh, recursive and co-recursive. And we're also going to make heavily use of uh, the monad laws, which hold up to um, by similarity. All right, let's do this uh, case by case. Let's start with a simple case of, of just integers. And now the plan is to, to start on the left-hand side of the equation and work our way manipulating the term to the right-hand side. So this is here the left-hand side of our specification that we want to have. And then we step-by-step step transform it into the right-hand side. Well, I say right-hand side, but we don't really know yet what the right-hand side exactly is because the compiler is not defined yet, right? So this is not defined yet. But what, what we're going to do is we're going to find some C prime, some term of, of type code uh, here, and then we just make the proof go through by force, just by fiat, by defining the compiler to exactly return our C prime that we here calculated. So this is where the, the definition of the compiler will indeed fall out of the, uh, the calculation proof. So that's what I meant earlier. And that's the plan. So let's, let's go through this step by step. So the first step here, we're just going to apply the definition of our interpreter. Evaluating val n, let's just return n. Then we can apply the monad laws, get rid of the return, substitute the n for v. And then we appear to be sort of stuck here, right? We want to get to a form given down here. Uh, but we are up, up here, so the stack doesn't match up. So what this means essentially is that we have to solve an equation. Uh, this one here, just replicated this here on the right. And the way that we're going to solve this equation is again by, by force, by definition. We're going to introduce this as a definition, uh, as a clause in the definition of our function exec. And how can we do this? Well, we have to make sure that all the variables on the right-hand side, so in particular n and c, have to, that they are bound on the, uh, the left-hand side. Right? And we're going to do this by introducing a new constructor of our code type that takes these two arguments, n and c, so, so that they are bound on the left-hand side. Right? And so we just call it push because that's what it does. It pushes the integer n 
on top of the stack. And it sort of it falls again out of the, the calculation, namely here the, our goal to, to get, uh, to solve this equation here. And not only that, we have introduced this additional constructor into our code data type. So we have discovered a uh, sort of a um, instruction that we need for our compiler. And this completes the proof for, for this case. All right, so now we can simply read off the definition of our compiler by just comparing this here to this up here. So we have that the compiler turns the val n into a push n and the continuation. And that's the whole trick uh, that we have here. And we just do this with the remaining two cases now. Right? So for the addition, again, we start on the left-hand side of our equation that we want to prove, apply our semantics of uh, addition, we get this out, then we apply our monad laws, which allows us to reorder uh, all these um, this nested do block and get rid of the return here. And now we again appear to be stuck because this does not match the left-hand side of our induction hypothesis, which we may, may use. But again, the trick is to uh, see this as an as a equation that we need to solve, which we can again solve by fiat, namely by introducing a new definition for our virtual machine, which puts the, the term into just the right form so that we can apply the induction hypothesis. And so we do. We apply the induction hypothesis first for y, and then, as it happens, this term is again in the right shape so that we can now apply the induction hypothesis for x. And so this completes the proof for this case, and now we can again read off uh, the definition of our compiler for the case of add. All right, one last case where we actually see some, some co-induction. That's the loop case. Again, we start on the left-hand side, apply the definition of our semantics, then we apply the definition of, of the bind operation, which allows us to move this later here, outside of the do block. And now we see so that this, this term here is exactly the left-hand side of our now co-induction hypothesis, which we are allowed to apply because we are guarded by this later. So no problem, we can apply now our co-induction hypothesis. And now we're almost done. Again, we want to have this, uh, the target is to get a uh, term of this shape here, and this is again an equation that we need to solve, which we again solve by definition, by just defining the virtual machine exec to be exactly in the right form so that it solves our, our problem here. And note that it introduces this later here, uh, right, because the later appears up here. And we can read over the definition of our compiler here, which is uh, now loop. So the, the, the loop compiles to this loop code. And that completes the, the calculation. So we've now derived a compiler for this uh, simple expression language. Uh, we derived the target code, we derived the compiler, and we derived the semantics of the target code. Right? And most importantly, we also proved along the way that it is actually correct, the compiler. Right? And indeed, it was the driving force for, for deriving it in the first place. All right, that was all the trick there was about this. But this was a very simple language, of course, right? A, a toy language. But we also applied this to more interesting languages. Um, so we did it for a number of different lambda calculi. So both in call by value and call by name form. Uh, we did it for a lambda calculus uh, extended with exceptions. And we also did a, uh, a language with loops, while loops. So this all uses uh, the, the partiality monad. And then finally, we also did this for, for non-deterministic languages. Here we used the language with interrupts. And there we had to extend our monad, uh, the partiality monad with uh, non-determinism effects. And all of these calculations has been, have been um, formalized in, in ACTA. All right, so a uh, few words about future work. There's a couple of things we'd like to do. Uh, extend this to register machines, so from, from stack machines to register machines. Uh, should be straightforward, uh, I, I believe. This one here might be uh, quite challenging, but I think the, the, the use of monads now allows us to uh, consider some more, more interesting monads that we can use to, to structure our effects. So if you would replace, for example, the partiality monad with uh, the interaction tree monad, where you uh, have additional algebraic effects, I can imagine that you can then sort of peel off 
um, effects step by step doing the calculation so that you get essentially a multi-stage compiler. Right? So uh, this is uh, something that uh, we're looking into at the moment. And with that, I'll, I'll shut up and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>